In the case of Liar Liar, um, we'd written the screenplay and my partner and I went to the set one day to watch it being filmed. And Jim Carrey was doing a scene uh, in the courthouse and he was doing it very inventively, very creatively, 15 different times, 15 different ways. And we're sitting there, we're standing there watching him and thinking, wow, this guy's really funny, energetic, he really cares about what he's doing, that's fantastic. Wouldn't it be nice if one of the 15 ways was the way we wrote it? because he's using the script as a springboard to his improvisation largely. And in interviews, he's in fact said that, so I don't think I'm saying anything that he wouldn't say. And in a way, that's a gift, because for the director, you have 15 different takes, 15 ways of approaching the scene. For the writer, who's trying to plant certain things that will pay off later on, who's trying to set up lines, uh, and there'll be a punchline later on, who's trying to build character in a certain way, it's not quite so welcome, because our job is to see the forest as well as the trees. And during the pressure of shooting, the actor might come up with 15 great, very funny ideas, but might not realize that in changing what you have there, something's going to be hurt in terms of tone or character or, or whatever it is. As great as it is to hear your words spoken by the right actor, it's even greater when the right actor changes your words and makes them better. Um, I mean, sometimes you write something and you just think, I think this is kind of funny, but... Um, I don't know if it's going to work. And then it's really funny. And then sometimes the joke just flies away, even when the right actor does it. But there's a moment in When Harry Met Sally where Meg Ryan is upset because her old boyfriend is getting married and she's totally hysterical. And I put this one line into it. It is a nothing line. I need a Kleenex. It's right in the middle of it. And it's a line that I knew was funny. But it wasn't like blinking, hello, I'm a funny line or anything. And Meg just hit it out of the park. And that's the moment when you think, oh, my God. Because it's an actor that really, especially when you're talking about a comedy, something could be funny on the page, but it is not going to be funny if the actor doesn't know how to convert it. A very famous scene in, in a Die Hard where Bruce Willis meets Alan Rickman. Uh, and Alan Rickman attempts to convince him that he's a hostage. Uh, and it's a, kind of a nerve, nerve biting, nerve biting, it's a nail biting, uh, uh, nerve wracking scene for the audience because, oh my God, he's gonna give this guy a gun. Uh, and this was not in the movie. Uh, and one of the things that frustrated um, Larry Gordon, the producer, and uh, Joel Silver, um, and John McTiernan was that we couldn't get Bruce Willis and Alan Rickman together. Uh, you, you know, you want the, just like a love story, uh, a, a, a film like that is a hate story. You want them to fall in hate, but we couldn't get them to meet together because if they ever met, th you know, they would kill Bruce and then the movie would be over. So we, we just sort of sensed as we got into the movie, how can they meet? How can they meet? And then one day, because I was on the set at lunch, Alan Rickman started kidding around and uh, uh, doing like voices and things. And, and I said, do you do an American accent? And he said, I don't do an American accent, but I do like, you know, a California one. And I go, hold it right there. And I went and I grabbed John McKiernan and said, listen to him, do that again. And John said, well, what's the point? I said, if he can do that voice thing, he can fool Bruce. And he said, no, 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 Bruce has already seen him kill Mr. Takagi, the head of the corporation. And I said, have you shot that yet? And the goat says, no, we're shooting that tomorrow. I said, if we can arrange that, that Bruce does not like, you know, see Alan Rickman, then the voice changing. So then we all walked over to the set, which was actually in a real, that building was a real building on the 20th Century Fox lot. And the, the set was really, you know, there. We went all went over to the set and uh, John, you know, looked around with his viewfinder and said, you know what, if we move that table over here and, and give it a quarter turn, this huge thick leg can block Alan Rickman's face. So that's the way he shot that scene the next day. He said, I'm going to shoot this scene the next day. You better write that scene. So I went off to the nearest vacant office on the lot. And while they finished the work that day, I wrote the scene, brought it back at the end of the day. Everybody liked it. And then they went and shot that like about a week later when it came up in the schedule. And this never would have happened, um, you know, had I not been on the set. I started directing almost, you know, unconsciously. I come from television where if you're a writer in television, if you're a writer in comedy television, you're very, you get very accustomed to, you know, not even thinking about it. You have the final say about your work. You know, that's what, that's what a television series is. Or the writer's in charge. That's the great thing. Inmates run it. You know, that's the great thing about television. And, and at a certain point, it was natural to try and get that same experience from a movie. And instead of saying, geez, they should do that, or I wonder why they don't do that, 
you just want to say, could we do this? You know, it's, and, and I think the batting average of, um, it's, it's interesting because, you know, there are a lot of professions that lead to directing, a lot, you know, quite a lot. And, but I think the batting average of writers who go to directing and actors who go to directing is really high.